All right. We're back. More computer vision. So we got some logistics going on. Uh, we have homework three out right now. I'm hoping that homework three is basically not going to be too hard. Uh, I think it's pretty, I can't get my mouse out of here. Where did it go? Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, I, I think it probably won't be too hard. It's using a lot of the, sort of the same techniques uh, that you guys have already used in previous homeworks, just sort of extending this into the time domain to do optical flow on video stuff, which should be pretty cool. Uh, there is this weird thing about open C. So if you want to sort of run optical flow on like a webcam to see what's actually happening in real time, uh, I have included some code basically for tying it into OpenCV to get images from a webcam and then display them. But the C API for OpenCV is slowly being deprecated. And starting in 3.4, they basically have made some breaking changes to it, which is super annoying. Uh, so it'll work on OpenCV version 2. It'll also maybe work on some earlier versions of OpenCV 3. You don't need to do this uh, to actually do all of the homework. It's just sort of for fun to play around with and see what's actually going on. Uh, at the end, hopefully. This for a second. Hopefully, you'll get something like this, where when you move around, you sort of get these little vectors that tell you where all the pixels in the scene are moving. Optical flow is pretty noisy, so you have to do like a pretty large amount of smoothing to get it to work right. Um, but you can do some kind of cool stuff with that. So that's the homework that you guys will be working on. Let's get rid of this. All right, so let me get this set up again. Do we have any questions about sort of logistics or what's going on or any issues with the homework so far? Anybody? Everyone seems good. Everyone happy with everything? Cool. Um, we still have Mattermost kind of hanging around and people are still asking questions on it. Don't do that. Uh, I am going to start checking Mattermost less and less. Uh, try to ask questions on the Google group. You may find that at some point I will simply stop responding on Mattermost altogether. Uh, hopefully get more people using the Google group system. That way it's just easier for other people to see what issues people have been having and figure out the answers to questions and stuff like that. Cool. So. We were covering a lot of stuff last time in this class. Uh, so we're just going to go through a bunch of it one more time and just kind of get you guys up to speed, hopefully, on some machine learning concepts. This is a weird lecture because half of you have taken machine learning and half of you haven't. So for the half of you that have taken machine learning, it is sort of review. And for the half of you that haven't, it's like a really fast introduction to a lot of different concepts. Uh, you don't have to totally perfectly understand everything I'm telling you. Just sort of a lot of it is to get you familiar with some of these words and things that we talk about and some concepts. Uh, and you can just sort of absorb some of the information. And we're going to go over sort of the important stuff, especially relating to neural networks and doing gradient descent on neural networks and backpropagation and stuff like that. We'll go over that a lot. So you guys will be pretty comfortable with that. But in the meantime, we're just going to talk about some basic machine learning concepts and sort of how people are using that for computer vision. So as we talked about last time, get back to this thing. Uh, machine learning is, uh, in, in general, sort of algorithms to approximate functions. Uh, we have a few different classes of machine learning. We talked about how there's supervised learning, where you have some labeled examples. Semi-supervised learning, where you have maybe a lot of training data, but not all of your examples are labeled. And unsupervised learning, where we want to model uh, un completely unlabeled data and just sort of find patterns in the data. So with unsupervised learning, one of the things we talked about was k-means clustering, where we're going to try to discover different uh, clusters in some data are sort of different groups of data that all look similar. And we talked about how there's a pretty basic algorithm, this iterative algorithm for doing k-means clustering, where we're estimating these cluster centers. And we're doing sort of this two-part algorithm where first we're going to reassign all of the points to their closest cluster center, and then we're going to move the cluster centers to be in the center of the points that are assigned to them in the data set. 
And when we run k-means clustering on images, we can get some cool results. So we get sort of some automatic segmentation by things like color. Uh, when, you look like, when you look at an image like this, we can sort of tell apart pixels that are generally pink and pixels that are generally green uh, if we do k-means with k equals 2. And so we can do this to get some sort of basic color segmentation. Uh, you could also do this maybe as one stage of a pipeline that would feed into some uh, refinements or something that would maybe get you a little bit more smoother segmentation for an image that looked like this, perhaps. Then we talked about how supervised learning uh, is typically you have sort of data with labels, and if we give you some new data, you want to basically predict the correct label. And so there are a bunch of components that go into supervised learning. Uh, one thing you have to do is sort of pick a model for your problem. Oftentimes, picking a model involves sort of thinking about your data and looking at your data and trying to figure out what constraints you can put on your data, trying to figure out what model would sort of best approximate the things that you may know a priori about your data. Uh, it also involves picking a loss function. So typically in machine learning, we have some sort of function that tells us how good our model is. And this is what we're trying to optimize. So you pick some loss function, and it should be some easy to calculate function of your model parameters. Uh, so this will tell you basically how good your function is, and then we can try to find uh, local minima or local maxima of your loss or your likelihood function given uh, some parameters of your model. So we'll try to figure out what the right parameters are for your model to, say, minimize your loss function. And some pretty sort of standard examples of loss functions are things like, oh, let me get this out of the right place, uh, things like our L2 loss, which is just uh, some squared error. You guys have probably seen this a lot before, or some of absolute differences. This is L1 loss, sort of Manhattan distance. And then after we've sort of picked our model and picked our loss function, we want to minimize this loss function uh, by finding the right model parameters. So we talk about basically finding global or local minimum of our loss function, and we, we've talked about some ways of doing this. One way that we've talked about is just setting our derivative equal to zero and finding some closed form solution to what our model parameters might be. Oftentimes that's not possible, so we do something like gradient descent. And so with supervised learning, we talked about a bunch of different sort of paradigms. So we talked about this split between regression and classification, where when we talk about regression, we're often predicting real valued input, like what temperature will it be tomorrow, whereas classification is predicting some kind of categorical output. So will it be sunny tomorrow? That's sort of a yes or no question. And classification in practice often looks like regression because we often end up picking or predicting probabilities for our classes. So we're not necessarily saying, yes, it will be sunny tomorrow. Oftentimes we end up predicting, you know, oh, there's an 80% chance of sun tomorrow. But it's still sort of a fundamentally different task than regression where, you know, the temperature could be anything inside a pretty wide range of numbers. Then, uh, you know, we have potentially different loss functions for these two uh, different classes of problems. So oftentimes with regression, we'll use something like squared error, whereas with classification, we maybe we'll use something like log likelihood, where we want to maximize how likely our training data is, or we'll use something like cross entropy loss. Uh, and in general, how we evaluate these different models is pretty significantly different, where regression, we basically want our model to output pretty close by values, and with classification, we just want it to predict the right answer. So oftentimes, we'll do something like accuracy uh, when we're evaluating classification. We also talked about basically this split between maybe these two different concepts of loss and likelihood. Uh, so when we're talking about how good our model is, we can talk about the mistakes that our model makes, or we can talk about how well our model uh, predicts the training data that we have. So loss is generally a measure of how wrong our model is or how bad it is, uh, and we want to minimize our loss function. And likelihood is generally a measure of how probable our model thinks our training data is. So we want something, we want a model, or we want model parameters that maximize our likelihood function. We want to get a high likelihood because a model that sort of fits in well with the training data will probably end up modeling some real function and be able to generalize well to new data. So 
with these two different functions, if we're trying to optimize for loss, we want to try to find model parameters that minimize our loss. If we're optimizing for likelihood, we want to find model parameters that maximize our likelihood function. Uh, it turns out that with both of these, you could sort of set the derivative equal to zero, and if there's a closed form solution, you could just find that for the model parameters. Or oftentimes, you have to do some form of incremental gradient updates, so you can do gradient descent with loss, and if you talk about likelihood, we want to do gradient ascent. But pretty easy to sort of switch between those two. You know, we can just sort of flip this sign when we're taking this derivative. We also talked about when we're thinking about loss functions and likelihood functions, we talked about this concept of convexity and non-convexity. Uh, and in general, convexity is really nice to have. And in practice, we don't have it that often, which is too bad. But when our loss function is convex, we have some sort of curve that kind of looks like this, where we have basically one minima or one maxima for the entire function. Uh, and convex functions are really nice because we know that if we find some local optimum for our model, that's actually going to be a global optimum. And that's really cool. Non-convex functions, we don't have the same sort of guarantees. So for example, in this little example of a non-convex loss function, we have three local minima. So at each of these points, if this were a loss function, over some model parameters. If our model parameters were set to this value, then the derivative of our loss function would be zero, and we would say, okay, we found some local optima. There's no obvious you know, sort of next step or no obvious place to go. And similarly, if our model parameters were set to this value, the derivative of our loss function would be zero, and the derivative of the loss function here is zero. So if we're performing something like gradient descent, uh, and we have a non-convex loss function, all we can sort of get to is a local optima. Uh, and we can't really necessarily be sure that it's some sort of global optima. But oftentimes in practice, just doing gradient descent on non-convex loss functions gets you to a pretty good local optima, uh, and, and that's all right. We also talked about this concept of bias and variance. So bias in machine learning is the error that our model makes because of the assumptions that that model places on the data. Whereas variance is sort of our algorithm sensitivity to noise. And we talked about how basically less complex algorithms have more bias. They make more assumptions about the data. And when we were talking about this, we sort of discussed how this linear model makes some pretty strong assumptions about the data that may not be actually applicable in practice. So you might have sort of this quadratic surface that your data actually fits to. And then just going sort of to a little bit more complex model, to this quadratic model, will actually get you a lot better fit. Uh, so, so in general, less complex algorithms have more bias, but they have less variance. Uh, and variance is sort of your sensitivity to noise. So more complex algorithms that can fit sort of really small changes in your data will often end up fitting some of the noise as well. So for example, we had this model where we sort of went through every point in our training data exactly. And we saw that if we picked two different sets of our training data to fit this model to, we ended up with pretty drastically different functions, this red function and this purple function. And that's showing that this, uh, that this particular model has pretty high variance. Uh, so if you sort of generate some random sample of your training data and fit a model to it, it might be sort of totally different depending on which model or training data you happen to pick. And so these are basically the two sources of error in machine learning. Uh, and oftentimes you're trying to find some balance of bias versus variance. You're trying to find a model that's powerful enough to uh, fit the data that you actually have that doesn't make any extra assumptions about your data. But you're also trying to find a model that has low variance because as you get higher and higher variance, you start overfitting to your data, you start overfitting to some noise in your data, and then your model won't generalize well to sort of new data points that come in uh, that might look a little bit different. So one of the algorithms that we talked about when we were talking about regression last time was linear regression. We're going to fit a line to some data, and we talked about uh, how a common way that we do this is minimizing our squared error. And we've actually seen similar uh, setups to this before, where basically we're going to end up solving this linear system of equations, and it just looks like inverting this matrix. And we've sort of already played around with this a little bit when we were talking about predicting homographies and affine transformations and stuff like that. We also talked about nearest neighbor, which is another 
regression algorithm that you can use where basically, instead of actually sort of fitting some model parameters, we're just gonna actually look at the data itself. And so if we have some new data point that we wanna predict, we're just gonna find its nearest neighbor in our training data and then just predict whatever the output was for that data point. Uh, and so we have some sort of different assumptions. Uh, with linear regression, we have a pretty simple model that makes a lot of assumptions about the data and has this really high bias, uh, but pretty low variance when we're talking about predicting different subsets of the data. So for example, if you imagine sort of picking out different points in this training set to train a linear model on, oftentimes if you did that selection pretty randomly, you would get a line that looks pretty similar. Whereas with nearest neighbor, we have a much more complex model uh, with very low bias. It basically makes no assumptions about your data, but high variance. Uh, we have a huge sensitivity to what the training data is because your predictions are just directly dependent on your training data. So if you imagine picking basically different points in this training set, you'll end up fitting totally different nearest neighbor models. Uh, and so basically these are two potential approaches for solving a problem like regression that you could imagine using in sort of different scenarios. And we talked about basically nearest neighbor would work well if you have a ton of data and it doesn't suffer from very much noise. Uh, and maybe the function that you're trying to fit is pretty complex, but you know that you have enough training data that you'll always have some pretty nearby point. Then maybe nearest neighbor makes a lot of sense. Maybe linear regression makes sense if you have more noise in your data and you don't have enough as many data points, things like that. We also talked about the other side of this is classification, where instead of predicting real values, we're trying to predict sort of categorical values. One thing you might think about trying to predict is sort of the probability of someone having the flu if they come in with some list of symptoms, and we sort of have this little toy data set. And we said that one way that you might go about doing uh, classification is using partitions. So let's just divide the data along one of the input variables that we have and just say that you know everyone on one side we predict has the flu and everyone on the other side we predict doesn't have the flu. And so if we use sort of this basic, you know, like temperature is greater than 99.5, we actually have a fairly decent prediction accuracy on this like really simple training set. And we talked about how we can sort of stack these partition uh, models on top of each other and get this sort of tree-like structure. So now this is a little bit more complex uh, we have this decision process of like, what do I want to do today? Well, the first decision is, is it sunny or not? Uh, and if it is, I have one set of choices to make, and if it isn't, I have another set of choices. Say it is sunny, then I can look at the temperature and decide, you know, if it's really warm and sunny out, I want to go to the beach, and if it's a little bit cooler and sunny out, maybe I want to go for a hike. Trees are cool uh, models for classification because they're really easy to interpret, they're pretty easy to use. You can sort of look at a decision tree that looks like this, and it kind of intuitively makes sense to you. You understand at every step what's going on inside the computer's brain, basically. And when we have new data that we want to predict, we have basically divided up our training data into these regions, and we can just see what region our new data point falls into to make predictions. If our data is noisy, we could have some sort of soft assignments. So instead of saying that you definitely go to the computer lab if it's cloudy out, we can say that there's a uh, fairly likely chance that you go to the computer lab. I don't really know what the other 5% of the time you do when it's cloudy out, something. Uh, and we talked about how basically people are using similar classifiers to this. So we looked at the Viola Jones face detection algorithm, which is this really fast face detector for embedded systems. And it uses a few new concepts that we discussed. So it uses HAR features, it uses a cascade of classifiers, and it uses this boosting algorithm. So HAR features we talked about are basically this really simple feature where we're just gonna add up some of the pixels in the image and subtract them from some of the other pixels in the image. And in general, this sort of makes sense because if you look at a face, there are some things that often happen with pictures of faces. The eyes tend to be fairly dark compared to the rest of the face because they're sort of in shadow. So you have this situation where the sort of pixels corresponding to this vertical bar of the eyes tend to be darker than the pixels corresponding, or sorry, this horizontal bar of the eyes tend to be darker than the pixels that correspond to the horizontal bar of the cheeks that are right below them. So we can use maybe a feature that looks like this to detect that. We also have this situation where 
Uh, if we look kind of vertically, we have this patch of the bridge of the nose, which tends to be lighter than the eyes on either side of it. So we can use a patch that looks like this to detect that location in your face. And there are several other of these that sort of make sense for why HAR features can work for classifying or detecting faces. And in particular, they're also really fast to compute because we're just summing over regions of pixels in the image. And you guys are working on this for your homework right now, but basically we use this concept of integral images to do these fast sums over regions of an image. So they can be really fast to compute these features. The, other, the next thing we sort of talked about related to this uh, Viola Jones algorithm, is this Viola Jones? Yeah. Okay, the, the next thing we talked about related to Viola Jones was boosting, which is this process of taking a weak classifier and basically making it stronger. So we talked about if we have some weak classifier that basically doesn't do that well for any given data set, but can always basically do something, we can actually train a bunch of these weak classifiers and together they will form a pretty strong classifier. So our general algorithm is that we'll train this first version of the weak classifier and we'll see which data points it gets wrong. So in this case, it gets these two blue data points wrong and it gets this red data point wrong. And then we'll reweight our training data so that those points matter more in our loss function. And then we'll train a new classifier based on this reweighted data. And now this new classifier definitely gets these points correct, but it has some new set of errors uh, that it introduces. And so again, we're going to reweight our training data based on the errors that this classifier makes. And we get uh, some third data set that has this reweighted data. And we then train another classifier. And you can sort of keep doing this forever. At some point, you'll get some diminishing marginal returns. But the basic idea is that if we combine all of these classifiers together at the end, we're going to have a much stronger classifier than just any of these individual weak classifiers. Uh, and this is a pretty common technique. So training on sort of your errors or doing boosting or doing, uh, yeah, doing, doing sort of this boosting process is really common in practice for machine learning. So gradient boosted decision trees are one of sort of the strongest machine learning algorithms. If you guys, have you guys ever heard of Kaggle, the sort of competition website? So everyone on Kaggle, the first thing that they do is uh, run gradient boosted decision trees on just all of the features that they have. And in general, it works really well uh, for some given problem, just kind of independent of whatever the problem is. So boosting is actually a really powerful thing that people use in practice. And the third thing that we talked about with Viola Jones is this concept of a cascade, where we're going to have basically a series of models where the first model is this really cheap model that throws out a lot of the easy examples uh, and basically doesn't get rid of anything that is actually a face. So with this first model, we want it to be really fast. We want it to get rid of easy stuff. And we want it to have a really low false negative rate. So we don't want it to get rid of anything that might have any possibility of being a face. And then as we go along, we'll get more and more complex classifiers that will look at smaller and smaller portions of the data, but will be more and more powerful. So our second classifier will be fairly fast and we'll throw out some of the harder images that may be uh, harder to distinguish between. And our third classifier will basically be our best face classifier. And it will definitely know whether or not something is a face. But it might take a really long time to run on these images. So for example, for Viola Jones, I think the first classifier just uses a single HAR feature. The second classifier uses about five HAR features. And the third classifier uses like 20 or 30 HAR features or something when it's looking at an image patch to decide whether or not it's a face. So we don't want to run this sort of third classifier over the image because it would take a really long time. So we do this cascade. And we can get a really fast classifier uh, that can process you know, these big images and look at all of these little regions really quickly, which is cool. So that's sort of our Viola Jones algorithm was this uh, boosted cascade of classifiers using these HAR features. The next thing we talked about was linear classifiers, where given some data set, we want to learn some weights, where the output of our classifier is just a function of the weighted sum of the inputs. And we, we talked about this a lot, where basically we end up drawing this uh, decision boundary, which is going to end up being this line. And on one side of the line, we're going to classify points as being in one class. And on the other side of the line, we're going to classify points as being in another class. And we went through basically a simple example of this, where 
given some new data set and some learned weights, we can predict basically which side of this line this falls on and basically what class they fall into. We talked about f a little bit, which is just gonna be some sort of function on this weighted sum. Uh, an easy function that you can imagine is just thresholding it at some value. So basically, if the weighted sum is greater than some amount, you predict one class. If the weighted sum is less than that amount, you predict the other class. We talked about adding in this bias term, uh, which is important for basically if we have some shifting in our data, we don't necessarily want the line of our decision boundary to have to go through the origin. So we can add in, in these weights that we've learned, some bias term. And then when we get some new data point, we basically either append on a one to it when we're doing this weighted sum, or we can imagine just adding on the bias, however you sort of want to think about it. Uh, and we can kind of get equivalent classifiers. We also talked about some different choices for this function f when we're talking about linear classifiers. One thing we might want to do is basically not have this hard threshold where we say, you know, everything on one side is in this class and everything on this other side is in this other class. What we might want is to have some sort of smooth function. And in general, we might want this because it makes optimization easier. We may also want it to model some uncertainty that we might have. So things that fall near the boundary of this uh, decision, near this decision boundary, points that fall pretty close to that decision boundary, we might want to see that we're sort of uncertain about which class they fall into. Whereas if you have a point that falls you know, way up here, we're pretty certain that that's going to be purple. And if you have a point that falls way down here, we're pretty certain that that's going to be red. So we talked about logistic regression, which is a linear classifier where f is going to be this logistic function. And we use sigma to sort of represent this logistic function. A little confusing because we've used sigma in the past for other things. But basically, sigma of x, or the logistic function applied to x, is this fairly simple formula where it's just 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x, which is also equivalent to e to the x over 1 plus e to the x. And what this logistic function does is map real numbers into this sort of probability space. So now the output of our linear classifier is basically going to be a probability. It's going to be some number between 0 and 1, which is what we want, but it will also have this smoothness property where things that basically are right in the middle, right, that fall right along our decision boundary, we're going to predict 0.5. And then we're going to get more and more certain about our classification as we go out in one direction or in the other. So logistic regression is this linear classifier uh, using f as our logistic function. And we want something to optimize to perform logistic regression if we want to sort of learn the weights for a logistic regression classifier. And this is also a little weird because it says logistic regression, but this is actually a classifier. Uh, I don't know who picked the name, but it wasn't a great idea. So we want something to optimize. And a good choice might be basically how well our model fits the data that we currently have. So one thing you might want to think about optimizing is basically given sort of some data x and uh, our model parameter is w, we can calculate how likely we think the actual label is that we have in the training data. And then we can think about optimizing w to make the actual label be as likely as possible for that data point. So our likelihood is just going to be how well our model predicts the correct probability for every data point in our data set, which is going to be this huge multiplication over all of the probabilities for the correct labels in our data set, given our model. And then we talked about how basically we're going to end up taking the log of this likelihood function because it makes the math work out a little bit easier. And so we've turned this basically big multiplication into a sum over all of our data of some uh, predictions, basically sigma of w dot x is going to be the prediction of our model at data point x. Uh, and we're going to be looking at basically if the correct label for a data point is 1, we have one term. And if the correct prediction for, or if the correct label for a data point is 0, we're going to have another term that go into this sum. And so now we have this log likelihood function that we want to optimize. One way we've talked about optimizing in the past is taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0. But we can't do that in this case because there's no closed form solution. So we're going to do gradient descent. We discuss gradient descent, which is basically uh, if we have some loss function. So this loss function is parameterized by 
the, or sort of the input to the loss function is the parameters of our model W. So you can think about the loss function as saying, you know, I have this set of data, and if you give me some parameters of the model W, I will tell you how well or how poorly this model, uh, this, these parameters W, fit the data that we have. And so basically every point along this loss function, we can think of the x coordinate, sort of the input to this function, as the model parameters, and the output, sort of the y coordinate, as our loss function for the data given those model parameters. And we want to end up minimizing this loss function because we want our model to fit the data well. And so if we get to some minimum here, we know that the model parameters that went into the loss function are pretty good model parameters, are basically the best model parameters that we can find to uh, minimize the loss function over the data that we have. And we may not be able to find sort of a closed form solution, so we may not be able to predict exactly what these model parameters are here, but we can calculate gradients, and gradients will point in the direction of steepest ascent in our loss function which means that if we look at the gradient for this point here, it's going to be pointing to the left. If we look at for the gradient for any point sort of along this side, it's going to be pointing to the right. And so our general algorithm for gradient descent is that we have some loss function, and we have some current model parameters. So we're somewhere along this curve. And we don't really know the entire shape of this loss function. We just know very locally what the shape, what the gradient looks like at a given point for our model parameters. So what we're going to do is take the derivative with respect to these model parameters and see which direction it points. And whatever direction it points, we're going to move in the opposite direction because it points toward ascending the loss function and we want to descend the loss function. So then we're going to make some really small adjustments to our model parameters w and then recalculate what our gradient is at this new point and keep basically do this process over and over again. And after we've done this enough times, uh, hopefully at some point we will end up in some local optima or sort of near some local optima. <clears throat> and formally, gradient descent looks like this, where we have our parameters of our model w at time t plus 1 are just going to be our model parameters w at time t minus some scaled version of the gradient of our loss function. And this scalar eta is some step size and basically, we don't necessarily want to uh, take really big steps. Uh, so oftentimes, because basically at any of these given points, we sort of only know this really local structure. We don't know uh, how far basically it extends on either side of this point. So we oftentimes want to make pretty small steps when we're doing this gradient descent. So we have this scalar factor eta, which is our step size when we're doing gradient descent. Now we talked about stochastic gradient descent, where if we wanted to estimate, or if, if we wanted to calculate the gradient of our loss function over our entire data set, that often is pretty computationally expensive. So instead, we can calculate basically some estimate of our loss function over some smaller subset of our data. And basically, we're going to randomly sample some subset of our data, do our gradient calculation just on that subset, uh, and then use that to update our model parameters. And so in batch gradient descent, we can basically have some subset of you know, some points in our data set that we sort of select randomly. Uh, and one thing we can even do is basically do uh, stochastic gradient descent with a single point. So we can pick one point out and calculate the gradient of our loss function just for that individual point, and then move our weight parameters a little bit uh, in the opposite direction just for that one data point. And it turns out that even if you do sort of uh, this, this really rough estimate of your loss function just using a single point, you do this enough times over enough data points that all of sort of your little errors start to average out and you end up converging to a pretty good solution for your model parameters. So the number of points in stochastic gradient descent that we use for one of these updates is called our batch size. You can use a batch size of one. You can use a larger batch size. In practice, it's nice to use uh, something a little bit larger than one just to sort of smooth out some of the really crazy stuff that happens when you're just using a single data point to estimate your, the gradient of your loss. So we talked about how we're going to do stochastic gradient descent with logistic regression. And we went through an example where we set our batch size equal to one. Uh, and 
we basically have this log loss function, or log likelihood, that we want to maximize. And we want to maximize it for basically a single point. So we figured out what our equation was for the likelihood of a single point. We took our derivative, and a bunch of math later, we sort of got to this uh, output as the derivative with respect to our weights at that single data point. And then we figured out basically our weight update rule for logistic regression. So the weights at time t plus 1 are going to be the weights at time t plus, because we're talking about likelihood, uh, the basically x parameters, uh, so the input to our data, or to our model, multiplied by basically how far off, or sort of the distance from the correct prediction, or sort of the correct label for the data point y, minus the prediction that our model made. And we're doing sort of gradient ascent, so we're going to add on this gradient term instead of subtracting it. Cool. That was all the stuff that we did last time. And we're just going to keep cruising through a bunch of stuff this time. Uh, so we're going to talk about more machine learning for vision, some applications. And at the end, hopefully, we're going to get to neural networks. So with logistic regression, we just had this binary classification problem that we were doing. Where we're predicting 1 or 0. And we may, in practice, have more classes than that. Uh, you know, whether it's sunny tomorrow is one prediction that you could make. You could also imagine predicting, you know, is it going to be sunny or partly cloudy or mostly cloudy or cloudy or rainy or snow or hail or there's, you know, a bunch of different classes that you might want to predict for something like what the weather is generally going to be like tomorrow. So we can extend logistic regression to have multiple or to predict multiple classes. And how we're going to do that is, for each class, we're going to have its own set of weights, wk, that will basically map the input to the output. And we want to predict some probability distribution over classes. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to say, you know, it's definitely going to rain tomorrow. Like, the probability of rain tomorrow is 100%, but also the probability of sun tomorrow is 100%. Actually, that could make some sense to sort of predict if they were occurring at different times. Uh, but let's examine that we're predicting just for a sort of noon tomorrow. Uh, you wouldn't want to predict basically 100% confidence that it was going to rain and also that it was going to be sunny. So we want to predict some probability distribution of our classes. And to do that, we can't just sort of do these separate logistic regression problems. So one thing you could imagine is basically for every class, let's just do, let's just have a separate uh, logistic regression classifier. So, you know, for class one, the probability that the data point belongs to class one is just some logistic regression model with our weights for class one. And this would be our weights for class two. This uh, slide is a little bit wrong. This should be W2. So the probability that a data point belongs to class two would be sort of a separate logistic regression model, et cetera. Uh, we can't do that because basically we have these unnormalized predictions. And if you sum together all of these probabilities that you end up predicting, they might sum to some number that isn't 1. Uh, they might sum to 0. You could predict that you know, nothing was going to happen tomorrow, which also wouldn't make much sense. So for uh, multiple classes, we basically want to normalize logistic regression somehow. And what we're going to end up using is this softmax operation. And what this is, is basically, if we want to take the softmax, again, uh, we're using this, this variable sigma. So sigma in multiple dimensions is the softmax operation. And if we're just talking about a single input, is the logistic uh, function. So softmax can be thought of as basically extending the logistic function into multiple dimensions. And what softmax is, is we take uh, e to the power of all of the components in this vector. And so the first component in uh, the output vector will basically be e to the first component divided by the sum of all of these uh, exponents of the input vector. So we can imagine that if we just have two classes, uh, sort of we, this z vector that we feed in is just two variables. It's just z0 and z1. If we imagine that z0 is equal to 1 and z1 is equal to some weighted sum w uh, times x or w dot product x, uh, 
then this basically just becomes normal logistic regression. Then we would have basically uh, the probability of z1 would be e to the w dot x divided by the sum of uh, e to the w dot x plus, uh, and this should be, z0 should be 0 instead of 1, uh, and e to the 0 would be 1, so we would have e to the x divided by 1 plus e to the x, uh, which is just sort of our standard formulation for logistic regression. But this generalizes to multiple classes because our input vector z is now going to be our weights applied to our input variables for each of our different classes. So what we end up getting is this uh, prediction where basically we have these weights for all of the separate classes and the probability that some data point x belongs to class j, the probability that y for that class or for that data point is j is going to be this normalized prediction where again we're taking uh, this dot product of our weights and our input but now we have specific weights for every class and then we're just going to normalize by the sum of all of these uh, exponents. So this is summing across all of our different classes k e to the x dot product with k. Does this sort of softmax function make sense to people? Do people sort of see why this is similar to doing logistic regression, but basically now we're just gonna normalize based on all of the probabilities that we have so that in the end we basically get this uh, output prediction where we're predicting a bunch of probabilities for a bunch of different classes, and these probabilities are gonna be well behaved. So each of them is gonna fall between zero and one, and also the sum of all of them is gonna sum to one. Uh, which is nice because we're predicting basically a probability distribution over classes. Anyone have questions about sort of the softmax function? Softmax is super useful and important later on when we're doing some cool classification stuff. So what this ends up looking like is basically this little model that we have here uh, where we have sort of this intermediate state B uh, and we're gonna fill in each of these terms with a weighted sum of the input. So we have you know, separate weights for each class. So we have uh, W1s, which map, you know, W11 maps X1 to B1, W12 maps X2 to B2, and W13 maps X3 to B1. And so each of these Bs is gonna be a weighted sum, I don't know where my mouse went, you run out of battery. Uh, each of these Bs is going to be a weighted sum of our input. And then we're going to, and these are sort of unnormalized probabilities that we're going to be predicting. And then we're going to apply this softmax function to this output vector B. And we end up with some normalized probabilities, which are going to be this prediction, basically Y. And in practice, we can sort of equivalently write this network as this matrix operation where we have this matrix of our weights uh, W, we have our input X, we also have this bias term that we talked about that's really important, uh, and that's what sort of these plus Bs were on this slide. This is sort of our bias term here. And so the output of a multinomial logistic regression model is just going to be this matrix operation of W times our input X plus uh, sort of our bias terms B, and then we're gonna apply our softmax operation on this output vector to get our predictions. So what is multinomial logistic regression useful for? One example is recognizing handwriting. So MNIST is this cool handwriting data set. It's this uh, computer vision data set put together a while ago uh, that basically was a bunch of handwritten digits and there are 50,000 of these images. They're really small, they're 28 by 28. Uh, and let me plug in my little thing so it'll work later. It's 50,000 images of handwriting uh, and it's just numbers. So it's just the numbers zero through nine. So you can frame this as this uh, softmax or multinomial logistic regression problem where your input is basically pixel values. So it's 28 times 28 pixel values. So 784 different pixel values. And 
you're trying to predict whether or not a little digit falls into one of 10 classes. So you have the number zero through nine. And it turns out that if we train a little logistic regression algorithm or our multinomial logistic regression algorithm, uh, so just a sort of single layer that will do this weighted sum and then perform the softmax operation, we actually already will get pretty good results. So we'll get 95% accuracy on this task just by using this sort of softmax regression. Pretty cool, right? Anyone have questions? We'll come back to MNIST at some point too because it's been a sort of pretty popular data set for people to try out things on in computer vision. Uh, you guys will be playing around with it at some point too because it's pretty simple. It's like really small too, 28 by 28 images don't take up a lot of space. So even though there's 50,000 of them, it's not a very large data set. Anyway, that's it for logistic regression. And we're going to talk a little bit about support vector machines, which are still this kind of linear classifier, um, but with some added constraints. And this is basically the algorithm that has powered a lot of old school computer vision techniques um, and is, is pretty important to sort of the computer vision field. So it's important to know a little bit about it. Okay, so with, when we're talking about when we're talking about uh, linear classifiers, you can imagine that there are a bunch of linear, different linear classifiers that all separate our data, especially if our data is pretty well separable. So for this example, we have sort of these data points here and these data points here, and we want to draw some classifier between them. So you can imagine H2 and H3 are both linear classifiers that separate this data. They both, in some sense, have perfect accuracy. So how do we know which one of them is better? Uh, for some sense of the word better. What SVMs try to do is find sort of the best linear classifier. And the way that they do that is they maximize the margin between the classifier and the data points. So this classifier H2, the closest data points to that decision boundary are sort of this data point here, which has kind of this distance, and this data point here, which has kind of this distance. And this linear classifier H3, seems to have some sort of better properties to it. Uh, because when you look at sort of the closest data points to this decision boundary, we have this much larger distance, this much larger margin. So we can think about support vector machines as trying to find the linear classifier that has the largest margin separating the data of different classes. Uh, and so we're gonna be basically doing this max margin classification where we want to find the linear classifier that maximizes how far apart the data points fall from this decision boundary that we're predicting. And the data points that actually fall along this margin, sort of right along this, uh, along this line, are gonna be called our support vectors. And so our entire basically linear classifier is gonna be based on these support vectors. You can sort of see that uh, if you moved around basically this data point and moved it a little bit over here, if you took this data point and moved it over here, it wouldn't affect how much our linear classifier is separating these two sets of data. So it wouldn't affect the actual end prediction or sort of the end model that we come up with. So all of the data points that are not on the margin, all of the data points that are not support vectors, end up not actually mattering to what this end uh, linear classifier is going to be. Whereas if we took this, uh, this data point here, and if we shifted it by a little bit, it would end up shifting this linear classifier a little bit because it is a support vector. So it actually sort of matters in terms of what our end linear model is going to be. And this means that basically as we're uh, sort of refining or coming up with these linear classifiers to try to find which one is best, all we have to keep track of are these support vectors uh, instead of keeping track of all of the data because they're the ones that sort of matter when we're talking about trying to figure out what the best linear classifier is. So support vector machines, if our points are linear, linearly separable, there is basically some distance between the decision boundary and those data points. And what we want to do is 
we're going to end up basically setting that distance to be 1. So we saw over here that uh, basically we're doing the same, the same process that we did before, where we're going to do this weighted sum of our weights uh, by our input x, and we're going to add on some bias term. And we're going to imagine that basically the distance between this decision boundary and this data point is going to be 1. Because if our data is linearly separable, then what we can do if we, if we were going to not set this to basically be equal to 1 is we could crank up these weights to be really, really high. And that would sort of arbitrarily increase the size of our margin without actually doing anything interesting. So instead, what we're going to do is set this sort of distance, set our margin to be equal to 1. And then we're going to try to find the minimum weights possible to make sure that our margin is one or larger for all of the points in our data set. Uh, so we're going to minimize the weight such that the margin for each data point is at least one. This makes sense for data that is linearly separable. Sometimes we have data that isn't linearly separable. Uh, and what we're going to do in that case is basically introduce this slack variable so that misclassified points incur some penalty, uh, but we still basically want to minimize now this joint sum where we're minimizing both the weights such that the margin has this property, but we're also minimizing the cost that we incur from these misclassified points. And if we set up our basically problem in this, in this way, uh, we can actually solve this minimization problem using something called quadratic programming. I don't know what that is. Uh, but it's some cool thing, I guess. Uh, but in practice, SVMs are sort of really widely used uh, because they can handle a lot of data. They can also handle basically a small amount of data. And uh, since they're doing this sort of max margin thing where they're finding what is maybe sort of the best linear classifier, they end up dealing pretty well with, uh, with a lot of different domains and with data that uh, has a lot of weird things. So one thing that can happen in computer vision is you have a bunch of different features and you don't have very many data points because it's really hard to basically go through images and label them by hand of like, this one is a dog, this one is a cat, whatever. So you might have this domain where you have a bunch of features, but uh, maybe only a few things that you're trying to predict and you're not necessarily sure which features actually matter. You have so many of them that you might just end up fitting to kind of noise in your data set really easily. Support vector machines are nice because uh, you have this sort of regularization where you're trying to minimize the weights that you're using, but also sort of find the best hyperplane that divides your examples into different classes. So just some examples of SVM being used in practice. One really common one that people talk about is uh, Dalal and Triggs person detection. So what Dalal and Triggs did was train an SVM on hog features. So we've seen hog features before. And they were training this SVM to look for two different classes, person or not person. And what you're going to do is at test time, basically extract features from uh, a new image at a bunch of different scales. And then you're going to run this classifier, this SVM, over a bunch of different locations and a bunch of different scales and try to find people in that image. So we have a bunch of different scales. We're basically going to take the same image and resize it to a bunch of different sizes. And then we're going to run this SVM basically at every single point, at every image, uh, at all of these different scales. And we're going to say, is this image patch a person? And we're running this on the hog features of this image patch. And then we're going to move our window a little bit and say, is this a person? Is this a person? Et cetera, over and over again. And at some point, you might run into some image patch that is, in fact, a person. And hopefully, your SVM will predict yes for that patch and we'll predict no for all of the other patches. And we get basically this sliding window detector uh, where we have trained this SVM that can distinguish between people and not people. And then if we just sort of run this classifier over the image at a bunch of different places, uh, we end up finding uh, the people. So we end up basically doing object detection just by using this classifier that can tell person or not person. So that's one cool. Uh, usage of support vector machines on sort of these hog features. But at some point, basically, we might want to detect something other than people. And it turns out that doing this with just sort of this individual template uh, 
this sort of one classifier that we have here that we talked about uh, that just sort of looks like a person. Uh, if we just run this individual template, it can't really account for a bunch of variation that happens in the visual world. So this template would be good at sort of detecting people that are kind of standing normally, but if you like start tipping over, or doing weird things with your arms and legs, uh, it probably would fail to detect me as being a person. So instead, what we're gonna talk about is uh, deformable parts models, which are sort of an extension on top of this sliding window-based classifier. And the key idea is that objects are made up of different parts, and those parts can kind of move independently. So what we're gonna do is train a base model that looks for sort of the general form of the object, but we're also gonna train different parts models. And we're gonna learn where those parts generally are on an object, and we're also gonna learn how far we can sort of expect those parts to move. So this ends up being sort of this springy model that says that your arm can move a little bit away from your body, but if your arm moves really far away from your body, that's probably not that likely to happen, uh, so that's probably not a person. So what we end up with is basically this base model that we still see looks a lot like kind of the person that we had before, but we also have these individual part models. So we have maybe a part model for the head, a part model for the arms, uh, maybe this is the waist and the feet or something. And we also learn sort of this uh, springiness of each of these parts. So where we might expect to find these parts relative to the base model. So it looks like the head can sort of be somewhere in this region, the arms are a little bit more constrained, uh, et cetera, for sort of the different parts of this model. And so, Somehow, using SVMs, we're going to learn these different mod uh, sort of these different components of our model, this base model, the part models, and uh, this, this sort of orientation or location of these different parts. And if we have this model, at test time, it's fairly easy to run this deformable parts model. So first, what we're going to do is uh, at a bunch of, again, we're always doing this detection problem at a bunch of different scales when we're talking about sliding window because people can be sort of large or small in the image. So we're gonna extract our hog features at a bunch of different scales. And then at every scale, we're gonna look at the hog features for that scale and also the features at two times the resolution at that scale. And we're gonna run our base model over just the normal feature map and we're gonna get some response of basically this root filter, sort of our base filter and that we see here. We're also gonna run each of our part models over the feature map at twice the resolution. So this is sort of the, uh, this is our part, our, our, our part classifier for sort of heads of people, and we're gonna run it over our image and get some sort of response, and we have sort of our arm classifier as well, and we're gonna run it over our image and get some sort of response, and then we can, transform these responses based on uh, how far we would expect them to be from the base model and how likely the base model was at that location as well. Uh, and so we're, we're basically taking into account the response of each part filter or each part classifier as well as the response of the base model and how sort of springy we know this individual part to be. So maybe the arm can move around a lot, but the head can't move around very much, and we get sort of this transformed response. And then we're gonna take these transformed responses and basically add them all together, and we have this combined score at all of these different root locations for where a person might actually be in this image. And generally after we do sort of this Final step, we're gonna do some non-max suppression like we talked about earlier. So we can kind of see that it looks like basically there are two general people looking thing in this image. The sort of overall response of our model is really high at this point and is really high at this point and then sort of tapers off after that point. And if we look at sort of the original image that we ran this on, there are sort of two people at those two locations, which is cool. One problem with doing this deformable parts model is that we don't, for any given object, we don't necessarily know what the different parts are, and we also don't know their locations or sort of how springy they are. So one key idea in deformable parts models is learning this latent SVM, where we're also at the same time as learning basically how to classify 
you know, the head of a person versus not the head of a person, we're actually going to learn what these part locations are. And we're going to learn what they look like. So uh, there's, a, there's a way to basically formulate this problem such that you're minimizing this cost function. So you're simultaneously learning where the parts are relative to all of the objects and how to recognize these parts. And this means that basically we can feed in a bunch of pictures of people and our model on its own will learn to recognize interesting things. So it'll actually learn on its own that like a head is a part of a person and it's also like sort of a good thing to look for when you're trying to recognize if someone is a person or not. Uh, in general, heads have faces on them and faces are, as we saw before, pretty, uh, pretty distinct. So we have a lot of features on our face that are pretty common across people and are pretty easy to detect. So this is cool. Uh, deformal parts models uh, are learning this latent SVM, so we're, we're learning all of this sort of new information that we're not necessarily passing explicitly to our algorithm. We also have this problem that during training, we're gonna have a bunch of negatives for every positive example. So we talked about how this is basically the sliding window approach where we're gonna look at every single image patch and decide whether or not it's a person or whether or not it's a bicycle, et cetera. And so what ends up happening is, you know, there are a bunch of image patches that don't have people in them and a few that end up having people. So when we're training this SVM, we have this huge class imbalance where we have a ton of negative examples and only a few positive examples. And if you don't do anything about this class imbalance, you end up in this really weird place where your model is seeing a bunch of image patches and almost all of them don't have people in them. So it's just gonna always predict that there's not a person in an image because that's sort of the thing that is gonna minimize its cost function the most. So one thing that deformable parts models uses is this idea of hard negative mining. So what we're gonna do is go over all of the images in our training set and figure out areas in every image that the model is really sure are people, but we know from the labels in our training data don't actually contain people. And we're gonna, so, so these are sort of the areas of the image where the model makes the biggest mistakes. And we're gonna call these hard negatives. And so all we're gonna train on uh, while we're training this SVM is basically the positive examples, the areas of the image that we know are people, and also these hard negatives, the areas of the image where uh, we're making some pretty serious mistakes. And there are a number of ways of sort of fiddling with this. Sometimes you wanna mix in some sort of easy negatives so your model doesn't just kind of overfit to uh, true positives and hard negatives. Uh, sometimes you wanna basically do some kind of balancing act, but the important part is basically uh, we don't want to look at all of these easy background negatives. For the most part, we want to focus on sort of the things that we're getting wrong, these hard negatives. So another thing that people used to use uh, these support vector machines for is just image classification. So this is the problem of just given an image, what is in that image? Uh, and there were, was a bunch of work on this sort of before the current uh, neural network craze hit of using support vector machines on top of features. So the general uh, state of the art way of doing this was we're gonna get some image, we're gonna extract a bunch of different features from it. So we talked about SIFT features before and how they're kind of useful for recognizing things that are going on in images. Uh, Fisher vectors are basically some features in an image that summarize some information like gradients and color and stuff like that. So if we want to train some classifier for an image, all we're going to do is basically extract a bunch of features from all of our images in our training set, and then train some linear SVM on top of those features. And this sort of works. Uh, there's a really big data set called ImageNet that has uh, this training set that has a thousand different classes. And basically, if we take this approach, we end up with some model that is 54% accurate. So it has you know, a thousand different things that it can choose from, and 54% of the time, it'll kind of pick the right thing. If you give it a new image, it'll sort of predict the correct label for that image. Uh, so, so that's you know, clearly doing something, clearly learning something interesting about what's going on in that image. Now, there are some problems with basically taking this approach of like, 
you know, it's just extract a bunch of features and train an SVM on those features to predict whatever it is we want to predict. And the hard thing is uh, machine learning needs, you know, really good features, and it's not often clear what the right features are going to be. So we talked about hog features, we talked about SIF features, uh, we just very recently talked about Fisher vectors. You know, which ones should we use for a given problem? Uh, there are different pluses and minuses to each of them. For example, uh, hog features are uh, not rotation invariant, so they're sort of dependent on rotation, whereas SIFT features are rotation invariant. Which one is better? Should we use them for different things? Uh, both hog and SIFT basically throw out all of the color information. It seems like color might actually be important when we're looking at images, so maybe we should use Fisher vectors, but maybe they're not good at different things. And the end result of all of this is, you know, instead of spending all of this time trying to figure out what the right features are, why don't we come up with some algorithm that can decide for itself what good features are for the given task? And this is what neural networks are. In essence, a neural network is some big uh, feature extraction pipeline followed by some simple linear model at the end. And neural networks have been sort of hugely successful in uh, image processing, so on this image classification task that we talked about before, we basically go from 54% accuracy using uh, SIFT and SVMs to 80% accuracy using these neural networks. In object detection, we've gone from 33% mean AP on Pascal VOC using deformable parts models to 88% mean average precision uh, using neural networks, so this huge jump in terms of how powerful these models are doing these common tasks like image classification and object detection. So neural networks are pretty cool, and it's pretty clear that features are pretty cool. I want to see if this is done charging. Okay. So we talked about features. We talked about getting the right features. Uh, you know, why are features so important? What's going on here? Feature engineering is, in some sense, sort of the core problem in machine learning, uh, especially if we're talking about sort of machine learning in practice, if you actually want to go out and sort of predict things. So all of the Kaggle competitions, they're all kind of one with the same basic uh, approach. You're going to take a bunch of features and throw them into some decision tree machine learning algorithms, either random forests or boosted uh, gradient boosted decision trees. And the really important thing is basically what features you're feeding into these machine learning problems. So machine learning models are basically always going to work really well if there's a clear relationship between the inputs and outputs of this function that we're thinking about modeling. And if there isn't this clear uh, relationship, they're, they're not going to work very well. So for example, if we have data like this, and we're trying to fit some linear classifier to it, it's going to be really hard. Uh, you know, there's not really any line that can kind of divide these points from each other. Whereas it's pretty clear to us that like, you know, there's some sort of circle thing going on here, right? So like, uh, there's clearly some circle of radius something that divides these two sets of points into their different classes. So if we were sort of engineering some features, one thing that we might come up with as a good feature to add into our feature set is sort of x squared plus y squared, because now we can sort of take this plot of x versus x squared plus y squared, and now it's really easy to fit this linear model that sort of divides these two classes from each other. So before, when we just sort of had these original features, uh, it's, it's sort of a harder, it's a much harder problem to model. Whereas we just, if we just add this single feature to our training set, all of a sudden it becomes this really simple problem to model. All of a sudden we can do it with just this really simple linear classifier. And in particular, linear models can't do this kind of future transformation. Uh, they are just sort of this really simple weighted sum of the input features. Uh, there's not a lot going on here, so we basically can't do these big transformations that might kind of transform what our feature space looks like uh, in our data. So one thing we can think about is basically we have some inputs to our uh, machine learning model, and we have some outputs. What if we just sort of added on some additional processing steps? So feature engineering usually is just coming up with sort of some combinations of our features or coming up with you know, some functions that we add in on top of our features. What if we just built that into our model? 
So what we're going to do is basically add in this, this new, these new features, or sort of this hidden layer. And we're going to use a pretty similar process to what we were talking about before. So we're going to add in this, this new sort of layer that's just going to be some transformation of our input, where each, each element in this uh, hidden layer, h, is going to be just a weighted sum of our input layer, x. So h1 is just going to be uh, the weighted sum w1x1 plus w2x2, and we're still going to have some sort of function that we're applying after we do in this weighted sum, uh, some function phi. And so after we sort of do this process, uh, we can sort of think of this intermediate state or this hidden model. Uh, we can express it in terms of these matrix operations, which is nice. Uh, so we have sort of these weights, w, and we have our input x, and our output h is just going to be x multiplied by our weights, w, uh, with this function applied on top of it. And we're just going to write it sort of in these simple matrix equations, h equals phi of x times w. After we do this sort of intermediate step and compute these hidden layers, uh, the output, our output p, is just going to be a function of our hidden layer. So again, we're going to do the same sort of linear classification or linear uh, combination of our hidden layer that we before were doing just sort of a linear combination of our input. So now we have our output p, and p is just going to be this linear combination of our weights v with our hidden layer h. So v1h1 plus v2h2 plus v3h3. And again, we may or may not have some basically function phi here. And what we can think of this as doing is basically we have two separate things going on inside this model. We have this feature extractor, which is going to basically look at your input and come up with some new things about your input, come up with some new features. Uh, so it's going to do some sort of you know, linear combination, and then it maybe is going to apply some function on top of them. We can kind of think of this as what people are doing when they're looking at their features uh, and doing some feature engineering or doing some feature extraction. And after we do this feature extraction, we just have this same linear model that we've talked about before that we understand pretty well. And all of this we can kind of express in this matrix notation where we have these matrices x, w, h, v, and we're trying to predict this matrix P. Uh, and H is just going to be phi of x times w. P is going to be phi of h times v. Uh, again, we have sort of these functions phi, which may or may not be different between different layers. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but this is a neural network. So this is a neural network with just one hidden layer. Uh, but in practice, we can actually have just like a ton of hidden layers. Uh, you know, a lot of the modern computer vision models have like hundreds or uh, I think there's some that have like thousands of hidden layers. So there can be a really long sort of process of feature extraction that happens. And then at the end, we basically just have some linear combination of these features that our neural network has computed. And that linear combination uh, predicts some prediction that is the output of our neural network. So each layer is going to have some function phi applied to the linear combination of the previous layers. And this function phi is our activation function. And uh, we can sort of think of this as some extra processing that happens at every layer. And you might sort of ask yourself, like, why do we need this extra processing? What's going on here? Uh, so imagine that phi is just a linear activation. Imagine that phi of x equals x uh, for all of the layers in our network. We're going to basically go through this process of figuring out what p is. So p is going to be this uh, linear combination of h. And each of the h elements is just a linear combination of our input. So it turns out that if we sort of substitute in you know, h1 for this h1, h2 for this h2, et cetera, we have p, which is just going to be this linear combination of our inputs. Uh, so if sort of all of h is just linear combinations of x, and p is just a linear combination of h, then all we've really done is made this p, which is a linear combination of our inputs. And we're sort of back to this original model that we talked about before, where uh, the output is just going to be this linear combination of uh, our input. And that's not necessarily 
useful, right? Because we already talked about linear models. What we really want is something that's better than linear models. Uh, so in practice, we want phi to basically not be linear. And what happens if phi isn't linear? We actually have this really cool theorem that's called the universal approximation theorem that says that if we apply some constraints on phi, so if phi is non-constant, it's bounded, and it's monotonically increasing, then basically our neural network with just a single layer can learn sort of an arbitrary function. And the only constraints that we put on that function are that it maps from some bounded input space to some real number. And it's pretty clear that uh, you know, if, if our neural network is mapping from some bounded input space, the output is also going to be bounded. So the function that we're trying to model is also bounded. Um, but basically, uh, this, is, this is a really powerful theorem. So we went from before, you know, when phi was linear, we, our neural network was just sort of doing normal linear regression that we're kind of used to. But now we actually have this theorem that says that uh, if our neural network is using some nonlinear phi, is using some phi that has basically these constraints on it, we actually have this sort of arbitrarily powerful function approximator. So it will be able to approximate with, with the right weights and with the right size of our hidden layer, it will be able to approximate any continuous function uh, on sort of this unit hypercube, so in this bounded input and output space. And uh, you know, this is, this is kind of crazy. It says that we can basically learn any sort of arbitrary f as long as there are some constraints on f. So you know, what can't we learn? For example, we can't learn unbounded functions. So we can learn you know, some bounded subset of like f of x equals x squared, but we can't necessarily extrapolate to all of the possible values um, of, of f of x equals x squared, for example. So we can learn sort of these bounded functions, but we can't necessarily learn uh, these functions that might blow up to infinity. Uh, but in practice, this universal approximation theorem is really cool. It says that you know, if we sort of pick these values right, if we pick our weights correctly, uh, if we also pick sort of the size of the hidden layer correctly, we can basically have an arbitrarily powerful model. It says you know, that it's possible to create this model, but it doesn't necessarily say how we can go about creating this model. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. So remember that we talked about already gradient, doing gradient descent if we have this linear model. And in particular, we talked about this weight update rule, where the weight at some, the weight update that we're gonna do, the weight at some time t plus one, is just gonna be our old weights plus some scaled version of the derivative of that weight. And you know, this is with respect to basically all of the weights in our model, but what we really want are sort of these partial derivatives for each of these weights. We want the partial derivative of weight w1 and weight w2. And those are actually pretty easy to just kind of extract from this weight update rule. Uh, you know, the weight update rule is basically uh, the input x multiplied by uh, sort of the difference between the expected output y and the actual output of our model p. And so for weight one, we're just gonna look at the input x1 multiplied by the difference between what we wanted the output to be versus what our output actually was. And for weight w2, we're going to add on the partial derivative with respect to w2, which is just x2 multiplied by sort of our loss or uh, kind of our, our gradient delta, which is our uh, expected output y minus our prediction p. So then we just do some gradient descent or ascent, depending on which one we're doing, uh, using sort of these weight update rules. And to sort of get some intuition, it kind of makes sense to think about like a concrete example. So imagine that our input is just 10 and one, and we have some output P here. Now the question is, how do we want to modify our weights W1 and W2 if we want our predicted output P to be larger? So if y minus p is positive, uh, say that you know, we predicted some output p, but it was too small, so y is larger. So y minus p is going to be this positive number. Well, that means we have some positive number for y minus p here, and we have some positive number for y minus p here. And our weight update rule is going to be x1 times this positive number. So 
you know, for w1, it's going to be 10 times y minus p. And for w2, it's going to be 1 times y minus p. And so we end up adjusting the weight for w1 a lot more than our weight for w2. Why is this the case? Uh, well, this actually makes sense if we think about it in terms of gradients, because what we want to do is basically change our weights such that we're going in the direction where we're changing our loss function the most. And in this case, you know, this 10 is really big and this 1 is really small. So if we adjust the weights w1, we're going to have a much bigger impact on our output p than if we adjust the weights w2, which are just sort of operating on this much smaller input. Uh, so this was an example sort of for linear regression. Uh, and we can sort of think about the same thing if we have this negative 1 and positive 1 here. We're going to end up uh, making w1 smaller and making w1 larger. And we'll talk about how this kind of transforms itself into neural networks next time, because we're out of time. See you guys later. <laughs>